Thanks for clicking in. We upload new videos every week, so go ahead and subscribe for some encouragement. You also may feel led to sow into the ministry, and we have several different ways to do so. Your giving goes towards our outreaches we do all year round. Now, let's listen in. Getting involved in church can, can be a, a little awkward, a little uncomfortable. I, I remember going to my first church services. My ex-fiance from high school had a family church and her whole family was, you know, they were the worship team, they were the ushers, they counted the money, they did everything, parking lot and all, it was her family. And uh, it was very traumatic in some ways <laughs> when the family runs the church, it could become very cult-like. But I remember going in and, you know, and everybody loved me and everybody treated me good. And uh, there was just some things, though, that they would push me to do. And, and I, I was off the streets. And in my mind, I was like, yeah, I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not having that. <laughs> that. That's not happening. I mean, this was an extremely Pentecostal church. It, it, it was so rough that they would actually pull you to the front. And, and they would have you keep saying Jesus until you started stuttering. And then they would say, look, he's speaking in tongues. I remember Brother Rodney, whenever the preaching got good, would just take off running around the building. And there were just things I watched and I said, yeah, I'm just, I'm not, ha I'm not having it. I'm, you're not going to push me to, to do that. And I, I was like that in life. There's just certain things that, I'm not going to be pushed to do. And so when I joined church, it was very uncomfortable. I'm looking around and I see people crying and I, I see people with their hands up and, and, I, and I see people running around the building. I still yet to run around the building. I remember one time I went to a church and this prophet was there. He called me to the front and he said, the Lord told me to tell you this and tell you that. And the Lord said, I, I want you to, to do a lap around this building. And I remember looking at him and saying, nope. <laughs> True story. I was at Rock City Church in Towson, and I looked at the guy, and I was like, nope, <laughs> I'm not having it. And there, there, there were things that I thought were weird when I got started, but as I began to walk with God, and I began to read my Bible for myself, there's some things that I just said, that's not how God deals with me, and that's not what I feel led to do, but there were things that I thought that as I began to walk with God, things I would look at and say, I'm not having it, I'm not doing it, I, I started to find myself doing. Like, I, I started to find myself raising my hands more and more when I read scriptures, like Second or Timothy, when Paul is talking to young Timothy and he tells him, I would that men lift up their hands everywhere. And I'm a man. And that scripture applies to men and women, but I'm a man. He's speaking to me. If he's telling me to raise my hands everywhere, maybe I should start raising them in church and it will end up being in all places. But I started to see that if this is what Paul is telling me to do, and this is God's, God's word, then I'm not being obedient by not listening. Or I'm not being obedient yeah, by, by not listening. I started reading things like, shout to the Lord with the voice of triumph. Raise your voice, all ye people. Oh, clap your hands. I started to read these scriptures and I started to say, okay, God wants me to clap. God wants me to raise my voice. And I remember one day the preacher said, how many of y'all have ever gone to a sporting event and screamed? And I was one of the ones that raised my hand. And he said, how could you scream for another team to give victory and never scream for your savior when he asks for it? Amen. And it was just light bulbs begin to go off in my head. I used to see the old men saying, amen, preach. I said, I'll never be that guy screaming while the preacher's preaching. But then I, I, I went to 
books like Nehemiah, and it says that while the preacher was preaching the law, the people were screaming amen, because when you say amen, while a real man or woman of God is preaching, what you are doing is you are telling God, I am in agreement with that promise, and I need you to make that thing happen in my life, and where two or three gather together, he is in the midst. And I started understanding they were not saying amen and clapping to get the preacher riled up. They were saying amen and clapping because they wanted God to see that that right there is my promise today. But, but it, it, was, it was a journey, and there would be struggles I would struggle with, and I still struggle with to this day. I'm much like Paul. I, I'm a man of like passions. The good I want to do, I don't always find myself doing. When I want to do good, evil is present with me. There's a lot of things that God is still working on a brother with. But one thing I've always tried to evolve in is my worship. I can control that. I have power to change the temperature with that. I am in the driver's seat of that. Some of my battles, I'm not always in the driver's seat. I wish I was, but I'm not always in the driver's seat. Sometimes that struggle says, let me take a turn. But I am in the driver's seat of my worship. I am in the driver's seat of how I show God what he's worth to me. Now you have to understand, I got saved at 19 years old. I did not know what I was doing. By the age of 20, going on 21, but 20, by the age of 20, I was an ordained minister preaching at my church the third Sunday of every month at 20. At 20 years old, the third Sunday of every month, that was my ordination, the third Sunday with my Value City suit. <laughs> Pastor Sharps took me to Value City to get that suit. How many remember Value City suits? They were always oversized. The pants blew like flags in the wind. That was the style. That was me at 20. This was me at 18, boxing. From 18 there to 20 here, ordained, was only two years. That 18-year-old me had just gotten out of court for beating a felony drug charge where they were trying to charge me as a kingpin. And I put an FBI agent in the hospital. True story. My mother is still traumatized when I tell it. She's with your kids in the back right now. I, I made the Lord a promise when I got out of court. I said, Lord, if you help me beat this trial, I promise you I'll give my whole life to you. And from 19 to now, I have not reneged on it. I can count on one hand in 20 years how many church services I've missed on a Sunday morning. If I'm on vacation in Africa, I'm at a church service. If I'm on vacation with my family, I'm getting up early and going to a church wherever we are. I told the Lord when he got me, if you get me out of this, I promise you, you got my whole life. And I'm still trying to keep that promise to him. And I remember I went to court three different times. The state kept trying to get it postponed. They wanted me to wear a wire to bring the people I was buying from down. I refused to do it. That's not how I was raised. And I told the Lord, if you do this, the third time the judge said, the second time, he said, next time we go to trial, if you guys push this off again, I'm canceling the whole thing. We go to trial. The state's ready. And they come to my lawyer whispering and come to find out they need a chemist for drug cases that proves the drugs are real. And the chemist's car broke down two hours from the court. And they came over and said, we, we got to let you, let you go. My mom was like, oh, no, you're not. And I was like, huh? I want him to have at least 200 hours of community service. So my mom actually set the tone for my sentencing with community service. 
But I told the Lord, if you get me out of this, and literally I went to a New Year's Eve service. It was about three weeks after the court case. I knew going into that service, I said, Lord, I'm getting saved tonight. I didn't care if the pastor preached on same-sex attraction. I was going to that altar. <laughs> My mind was made up. Whatever the sermon is, I will be at that altar. And he did the altar call. And I remember the message was Isaiah where God said, I'll behold, I'll do a new thing. And it was on time. And I got saved to the New Year's Eve service. And the very next week, I was driving a church van every single Sunday around the city picking up families. Because I told the Lord, if you get me out of this, I promise you, you got my life. You don't got my Sundays, you got my life. So when I went on construction sites, I would pray for people because I was a union electrician for 10 years. I would pray for anybody that made eye contact with me and they looked like they were going through something. Hey man, can I pray for you? Big construction workers, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? I told you I was still struggling. Can I pray for you? And, and I would be preaching and telling people about God. I started having Bible studies on every site I went to. We would be in my car or we would be in little rooms and I would have construction workers all around me. They transferred me to Northwest Hospital to do some maintenance work for my company. I started having all the nurses in the hospital and doctors were coming up to me asking me for prayer. They would take me off ladders and God gave me favor with my company where my company just let me go. They would take me off ladders in the hospice to pray with families and relatives in the, in the moments of their last breaths. Because I told the Lord, if you get me, you got me. And people see uproar now, but they don't see how my car got repossessed and how my home was taken because I was paying for Modesty and Jalen's family's food and resources. And they were the very family that pulled the church bus up to my house when I got evicted and helped me get as much as my furniture that I could out of my home in Brooklyn Homes where we do outreach now at 28. I was feeding them and I wasn't eating. I had to text staff members and say, can you just buy me some food? Do you know how embarrassing it was as a pastor to text your parking lot people and ask one of them if they can buy you some food? Modesty's father worked at Burger King. He would bring me Burger King patties to reheat. Because I didn't do it for money. I told the Lord he had my life. And if that meant I had to go hungry, I'd go hungry. But I told the Lord, you have my life. And I would ask people for rides to church. And I would have to go to church and preach faith when my car had gotten repossessed. Not once, but twice. And I, I really believe that in those early years, God was testing my worship. He was looking at me to see, are you in this for me? Or are you in this... Because you have low self-esteem and you need a bunch of church people to validate you. I told him, if you get me out of this, you got me. And I never looked back. And I've been running strong for 20, almost 21 years. <laughs> never looked back. But it was a disconnect. And now the thought of turning back, I would say, if I had to, yeah, that, I'm not having it. You want me to miss church for a football game? I'm not having it. You want me to miss church to go to your cookout? I'm not having it. Because there's something about when God is good to you. It's not that you feel obligated but you just like David, you love being in his presence. Amen. Amen. It's not a burden. It's not a problem. It's not something I have to do. I just love being in his presence. I remember as a construction worker, they had mandatory overtime they put on my job. They got all of us clearity, uh, clearances for the, for the Social Security Administration. And it was mandatory. They spent $10,000 on five of us. And I told them I couldn't work Sunday. They said, if you don't work Sunday, we'll fire you. I said, if, if I miss a Sunday, what you get the following Monday through Friday will make you follow, fire me. 
because I needed this. Like humans need oxygen. My soul, like David, thirsts for you, God. As a deer panteth for water, so does my soul thirst for my God. God is always looking, not for worship, but worth -ship. So I started reading these scriptures, and I started seeing how worship is so important that my victory is actually tied to it. I would read about Moses, how he lifted his hands when he was on the mountain, and when his hands were lifted by Aaron and her, Israel had victory. And when his hands would drop, Israel would lose. Moses was so tired, but God didn't give him grace to put his hands down when he was tired. God said, Moses, you'll lose if your hands go down. So you can make excuses and lose, or you can pull some friends into this thing and make an adjustment. But whatever you do, your worship is key if you want to win. So he said, Moses, your tiredness does not give you a pass. Put your hands down because you're old and tired and you will lose. This is why people that isolate themselves often lose in life because you don't have nobody to lift your hands up when you're tired. But I would read this stuff and I started saying, okay, this has to happen. This has to happen when I'm not driving. <laughs> but this has to happen in my car. This has to happen in my home. This has to happen when I'm out and about. When I feel like I'm losing, what I got to do is I got to lift my hands because I'm showing God I surrender. And when he sees that I surrender, he says, I'm glad because now you've given the battle to me. Because Amen. Amen. after all, victory is what God wants for us. Paul said it like this. Thanks be unto God which giveth, uh, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory is not something we are praying for. Victory is actually something that we are coming from. Amen. Amen. I don't pray for victory. If I have Jesus in my life, I declare victory. Amen. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You don't realize what you have, how much victory you have, but victory is only unleashed when worship is taking place. What are some things that God wants us to actually have victory over? Well, I wrote these things down if, if you want to take, if you're taking notes, you can write them down too. But God wants us to have victory over shortage. God does not like you coming up short all the time. God does not like lack in your life. Why do you think he said, I want to make you the lender and not the borrower? Why, why, why do you think he said, my God, Paul, is, will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus? According, it's a rhythm, it's a musical term. He says, God gives supply when you come in rhythm with your purpose. Whatever you need, God will make happen. Moses wrote this down. He says, it is the Lord that gives power to get wealth. So if God has all this power, why do we have so much lack? God wants us to have victory over lack, victory over shortage. God wants us to have victory over solitude. It is not good, God said, for man to be alone. God wants you to have victory over solitude. But here's the thing. If you don't get worship in line, then anything that comes into your life will only distract you. So, so God, 
looks for worship. And when he sees worship, worship, that's where we get the, the victory over shortage, the lack. When God sees that he is worth something with your finances, he blesses your finances. When God sees that he is worth something in your singleness or worth something in your marriage, because it's not just single people that are lonely. There are married folks in here that are lonelier now than when you were single. God says, when I see worship, I will end the solitude. I will make the house into a home. I will bring the laughter back into the hallways. But it is worship that unlocks it. God wants to give victory over solitude. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give unto your bosom? Not God. Shall men give unto your bosom? God says, I I'm going to get it to you, but I'm going to use a person. Now, when I read that, there's two ways to read it. One way is by saying, I need a blessing. And a relationship is coming into my life. The other way like, that I like to read it is in this way. If God's going to send somebody into someone's life to bless them, why should not be the person? You can look at it from the standpoint of needing a handout or the one giving the hand up. I would rather be the one giving the hand up than the one needing a handout. But at the end of the day, whether you're getting the handout or the hand up, it is relational. And so you cannot practice solitude and be blessed by God. God wants to give you victory over solitude, but it comes with him knowing what he, is, what he is worth. If you can't love a God that you can see, then having someone you can see is going to be a distraction. He, he wants to give victory over suffering. Suffering is not God's will for our lives. Suffering comes with the Christian walk. But what father? See, when you father people or you're a mother to someone or mother people, you know there's things they got to go through in life to develop them. You can't save them from everything or you create a weak adult one day. If you don't discipline them now, then either they're not going to be able to hold down a job or they're going to be in jail with somebody disciplining them. So there are certain things that it hurts you to your core, but you got to let them go through. There's certain things that hurt you to your core, but God told you your child was going to be used by him. God told you there's a purpose. God told you they're going to be great. But what you tend to forget is God can't use anybody without a testimony. And so you're trying to save them from the gift that God is trying to give them to be used by him. Who would sit and listen to me if I never went through something? Well, you guys, I, I don't know what it's like to hurt. I don't know what it's like to have a bad day. I don't know what it's like to ever commit a sin. You know, I'm kind of perfect. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that for 60 minutes. You want to hear somebody say, yeah, man, I drank myself to sleep sometimes. There were some days before I gave my life to Jesus that I was running from bedroom to bedroom. I haven't always been the smartest when it comes to making decisions. I, I, I've gotten high a bunch in my life. You want to talk to somebody that's been through something because they're proof that if God can get them through it, he can get you through it. And the more broken they are the more qualified they are to reach different types of people. So, so there's things you have to watch your child go through because it's developing them. They're going to be broken up with. They're going to have their heart broken. They're, they're going to be betrayed. They're, they're, they're going to have things happen that are going to give them strength to not quit when they get older one day. But no parent enjoys watching their child suffer. No, child, no parent likes when their child comes home and says, the bullies just keep pushing me down in school. God doesn't enjoy our suffering. But the Bible says it like this, having suffered a while. Not forever, but a while. He will establish you. He will give you strength. He will perfect you. 
So God has to allow suffering to take place. But he always says, but woe to the one who it comes through. If Jesus couldn't get beyond the suffering or skip the suffering, and he is our mascot, he is our savior, what makes us think that we get to bypass it and claim him? The Bible says that we will suffer, but what does worship do? Worship gives you victory over suffering because what worship does is it shows God that you believe in him more than the pain. So worship gives victory over suffering. And this is where we're going to really sit a lot today, but worship gives victory over sickness. And we are triune beings. So when I say sickness, most people just think of cancer or, or you know, a disease that's in your body that's shutting you down. And really that's what disease is. It's when your body begins to turn on you and attack you. Most people tie sickness to the body, but we are triune. So if a person has a sick body, they also have a sick spirit and a sick mind. We are triune. You are seeing in my body the boil of my sickness. It is a side effect most of the time of something that you can't see, my mind or my spirit. And the same thing applies to if my spirit is off, my mind, my thinking's going to be off, my body's going to be off. If my thinking is off, my spirit and my body are going to be off. We are triune. So if one area gets sick, it is easy for it to transfer to the other areas. And why do sick people tend to hurt people? It's because the sickness has spread. So God wants to give victory over sickness. Either Jesus has stopped healing or Jesus only picks who he wants to heal. And when I read 1 John or 3 John 1, 9, it, it says, Beloved, I want you to prosper and be in good health as your soul prospers. God says, I want you to have good health. I want you to have prosperity. But it only happens as your soul gets better. It will happen from the inside out. W what is the soul dealing with? The soul is dealing with my relationship with God and my, my worship life. Moses said, on behalf of God, I am the Lord. That healeth thee. So how do we unlock these things? It is through worship. And so everybody that I'm talking to that is dealing with shortage or, or, or lack, what's your worship like? Is God in the resources? To every person that's in solitude, I'm lonely. I want relationships to come into my life. I want, I want good friendships. I, I want a good marriage. God is saying, what's your worship like? Most, and I'm so for therapy. I've seen, been seeing a therapist for the last three years. I am so for therapy. But understand this. Therapy is expensive when worship could have fixed it. And most would run to the expensive thing rather than run to the thing you can do all by yourself in your bedroom. Amen. Victory, who's going through solitude? Who's going through a season of suffering? Suffering is miserable. Suffering literally strips your joy away. And who maybe is going through a season of sickness? The doctors can't help. You've done everything you can do. And I believe that if you are in one of these categories, God is speaking to you today and saying today has to be the day that you make up in your mind, that you make a commitment that from this day forward, God, if you do this, you got me.
Hezekiah was experiencing all of these things. Because what you'll usually find is that when one of these things are a battle, they all tend to flare up. Poor people tend to develop sick mindsets. But you'll see that all of these things tend to flow together. If a person has a lot of lack, they, they, they've probably burned bridges and now they're in solitude. They've borrowed from everybody they can borrow from. Now they're just getting bitter with people that won't help them because they are isolated. They are living in solitude and solitude leads to suffering. There are single people in here that have been single for a while. And they'll tell you in the midnight hours, there's a lot of suffering that takes place. During Valentine's Day, there's a lot of suffering that takes place. And not just that, there are married couples in here that are living in lack and living and feeling like they are in solitude. And what does this lead to every time you walk through your doors? Suffering. I was talking to somebody the other day and they were telling me they were thankful that God got them out of a relationship because they used to actually drive around for three hours before they could go in the house. <laughs> they said they had broken up with this boyfriend, and, but they were still living together for a year and a half until the lease was over. And they said that they had to drive around for three hours just to get into the house because they didn't want to go into the house till the child was asleep. Because at least when the child is asleep, I can go right to bed. That's suffering. When you cannot even enjoy the home you're paying for. And eventually it leads to sickness. I, Isaiah said the whole head is sick. It's filled with sores that will not heal. Because when you see one of these, you usually see all of these. Hezekiah is experiencing all of these. And there's a lot of people in the Bible I can understand experiencing this stuff. Believe me. Pharaoh, for example. I, Herod. I, I, can, I can name a bunch of people that, that should have been experiencing these uh, symptoms. But not Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good guy. He was one of the best kings Israel ever had. He walked with God. It says in 2 Kings 18, verse 7, it, it says he, he walked with God and, and God was with him and he prospered wherever he went. Because when God is with you, prosperity is a must. I cannot have God with me and not prosper. Look at Joseph. You see him get thrown into a pit and it says the Lord was with him. You see him get sold into slavery, into Potiphar's house. But it says the Lord was with him. He got put into the prison and it says the Lord was with him. And he got taken to Pharaoh's palace and it says the Lord was with him. But every place he went, whether it was his father's house, whether it was Potiphar's house, whether it was the prison or whether it was Pharaoh's palace, everywhere Joseph went, he prospered and it got better. It's not always about what you wake up to. It's that wherever God allows me to wake up at, I'm making it better. Amen. He was prosperous. God was with Hezekiah because Hezekiah was about the things of God. His father was a different story. His father had pagan worship. His father hated the things of God. His father, Ahaz, was one of the most wicked kings to ever lead Israel. He broke down the temple. He disbanded or broke apart the worshipers. And when Hezekiah came out, on the scene as king, he proved that you can be good and come from a bad family. You do not have to be what you were exposed to. He lived for God. He went and the first thing he did was he brought the worshipers back. The worshipers. He didn't focus on the temple yet. He, he brought the worshipers back. Why? 
because what good is it for me to work on the building if inside the building it's empty? Because he wanted to bring worth-ship. His father showed God what he was worth, and that's why his father's leadership was one of the worst models. Hezekiah brought back worship. I wonder today, maybe God's not calling you to a kingdom, but maybe God's asking when it comes to your house, can I get you to bring worship back? He brought worship back. Then he began to fix up the temple. As it got better on the inside, he got it better on the outside. When Sennacherib came at him, Sennacherib was one of the most fiercest leaders from Assyria. When he came at him, Hezekiah read it, and you know what he did? Because it's a good time in his life. He said, I'm not having it. He went to church. Because that's what we do as Christians. Do you realize how mad the devil gets when you're hurting and you're crying and yet you still praise him and like Job and yet you still worship him and yet you came to church? How many people can say this morning was hard to get to church? Everything was trying to keep you from coming to church. You had an argument. The kids were acting crazy. You looked at the gas tank and it was nothing but fumes and everything was saying, stay in bed. Don't get out of church. You still got that hangover from last night. You're still not ready to get right with God. All of these things were going through your head, but somehow, some way, you made it to the building because God has something in store for your life. You didn't get here on your own. It was God dragging you and God pulling you and God pushing you because he's up to something in this season of your life. Whether you realize it or not, you would not be here if God forgot about you. Look at somebody and say he's up to something Hezekiah got the news and he said I'm not having it and he went to church that's what he did and it says that the Lord responded to Hezekiah and said Hezekiah I got this and the Lord went through the camp of the Assyrians and completely destroyed them. I mean, the Bible says that God sent a blast through their camp. Because when you take it to God, God has a way of blasting your situation. Hezekiah brought back the three pilgrimage journeys the Feast of the Tabernacles, the Passover, the Feast of Weeks. He brought back the pilgrimages. He wiped out the Philistines. He was God's guy. You didn't have to question whether or not Hezekiah loved the Lord. He gave his life to God's battles. And so when I get to 2 Kings 20, I'm confused. I'm shocked because it says it came to pass in those days that Hezekiah was sick. And this was not a cough. This was a death rattle coming out of his mouth. I don't know when it started because the Bible doesn't tell us, but we do know he only has a little bit of time to live. At some point, what started as a cough caused him to get tired, which led to him never being able to get out of bed. And for some people, you sleep 12 hours a day, so that would be a gift to you to stay in bed all day. There are some people that stay in bed so long, you, you think there's something fun under those covers because they do not get out of those covers all day long. But when you're a worker, staying in the house, staying in the bed is tormenting. When I got COVID the first go around, man, I was so miserable. I was on lockdown. Couldn't talk to nobody. Y'all remember that? Two weeks. I felt like I was losing my mind because I'm a doer. 
Imagine having to live your life in bed. When you're a doer, when you like to get things done and get moving early. Hezekiah has been shut down to the bed. He's so sick that you can feel the death in the air. And he has to be wondering, God, how could this be happening to somebody like me? Somebody that has been faithful. Somebody that has been your fighter. Somebody that you can give things to and not ever have to think about him again. How could this happen to me? And there will be moments in life where you just step back and say, how could this happen to me? How many can look at your life right now and if you're honest, admit it went in a direction that you didn't plan for at 18. And if you're honest, perhaps, and some definitely could say the opposite, but if you look at your past and you look at your old self, would your 18 year old version be proud of who you come or disgusted? This is not how it was supposed to go for Hezekiah. He had dreams. He had ambition. There was more he wanted to get done for God. And he's running out of time. He's sick. Why is it that good people tend to go through bad things? He has shortage. Not on money. He has plenty of money. His shortage is with his time. I only got days. He's in solitude. Because it doesn't matter if you're in a room full of people. When something is going on in your body, you often feel alone. Because what good is it to be in a room full of people if nobody understands how I feel? He is suffering. The sickness is painful. He is, he is suffering. He is suffering in his body. He is suffering in his mind. And he is probably suffering in his soul with God. And it all is tied to this sickness. In those days, Hezekiah was sick unto death. And the Lord sent Isaiah. Now, Hezekiah and Isaiah had a great relationship. Isaiah was actually Hezekiah's mentor. He, he was kind of like... Paul to Timothy. He was kind of like Elijah to Elisha. Naomi to Ruth. He, he was his mentor. And you could not get a better mentor than Isaiah. He's the prophet known as the eagle-eyed prophet because his prophecies were so spot on. He often used a lot of eagle analogies like the mother eagle stirs the nest to make the young uncomfortable Relating it to God and how when God sees you're, un, you're getting comfortable, he has a way of stirring your nest a little bit. Isaiah was the eagle prophet. Isaiah was the man of his age. You could not get more of a godly leader in that time than Isaiah. His visions were so sharp. He, in Isaiah 53, he laid out the whole crucifixion of Jesus to us long before Jesus ever came. Detail by detail. Isaiah was spot on. And it'd be one thing to have some nobody tell you bad news. You could write it off. But how can you say the eagle-eyed prophet got it wrong? Isaiah would have been more accurate than the best doctor. Because <clears throat> he had the eagle eye of God. 
So seeing Isaiah come in means that I am about to get a diagnosis that my doctor could not give me. I am about to get God's diagnosis. And he has to be excited because he's thinking about how faithful he's been to God. And the prophet comes in. And it's just a sign of hope. You ever had somebody in your life that if you were going through something bad, they are the one you want in the hospital room? Because just their presence gives you a glimmer of godly hope. Isaiah is walking in the room. And he says something shocking to Hezekiah, whose name ironically means God's strength. So every time that somebody says his name, God's strength, God's strength. It has to be frustrating to be called God's strength when your life looks like nothing more than God's weakness. Isaiah walks in the room and says, Thus saith the Lord. This is from God. I'm just the post, man. This is from God. Set your house in order. You know that God is dealing with you when you start to look at your home and realize you've got to bring order to it. You begin to see how God is stirring your nest up when you begin to realize that he is trying to set order to your normal. Yeah. Set your house in order. You only got a little bit of time to get your house in order because, and if God tells me to set my house in order, that means as great as I am, perhaps, perhaps I am a public success and a private failure. Because why would God tell me to get my house in order if my house were to already be in order? He could give me something else to do in my final days. But he says, you have a little bit of time to get your house in order because here's the reality, Hezekiah. This is from God. You are going to die. Can you imagine hearing a word from God that says there is no hope? You are going to die. Lay out your funeral. Buy the stone. Get it now so you can get a discount rate. Get it in order. Get your life insurance policies together so your kids don't have to fight over anything. Get the will in place. Get it notarized. You're going to die. <sighs> but what if, what if God changes his mind? Oh, by the way, you're going to die and you're, you're not going to live. <laughs> Just want to make that clear. He's telling him that there is no hope. And he doesn't hug him. Isaiah walks out. And when you read Isaiah 38's account, it actually says that Isaiah broke down crying as he was walking. Because it's hard to see somebody you've mentored, somebody you've given your life to, get this kind of news from you. And Isaiah is walking out crying. That's not the scripture I want. Isaiah is walking out crying. That scripture is going to come later. Isaiah is walking out crying and Hezekiah is crying. And if, if I was Hezekiah, I, I would say, but Isaiah, what can I do? Isaiah, Isaiah, say a special prayer for me. Hezekiah doesn't say two words to Isaiah and Isaiah doesn't say two words to him. But you know what Hezekiah does? I love this. Verse 2, it says, then. This is his reaction to bad news. 
This is his reaction to finding out something terrible. This is his reaction to, to, to the doctors not giving him good news. This is his reaction if he were to get laid off. This is his reaction if he got cheated on. This would be his reaction if he had to go through a divorce. This would be his reaction no matter what life threw at him. It says, then he turned his face to the wall. Why am I turning my face to the wall? Well, it's because he's in a bed in the corner of the room. And he's turning and rolling over from the people to look at a wall. Why? Because I would rather stare at a wall than stare at people that can't help me. I would rather stare at a wall than look at people that cannot give me the news I want to hear. Because what he's doing is he is turning from people and turning to God. That's what you do when life comes at you, you stop turning to people and you start turning to God. The reason your situation has not gotten better is you have talked to more people about it than you have ever talked to God about it. You have told your mother, you have told your sister, you have told your siblings, you have told your friends, but you have never gotten on your knees and told God how you feel. And God is saying, until you turn to the wall, Hezekiah, until you look at your situation and say, God, not people, God, I am not having it. I am not buying into this. I am not taking this diagnosis. He, it says he turned to the wall because he knew that this situation is so bad. I got to bring God into it. How many have a situation that's so bad that you got to bring God into it? Your marriage is not going to make it if you don't bring God into it. Your kid is not going to make it if you don't bring God into it. You're not going to survive your singleness if you don't bring God into it. You're going to lose the house, lose the car, lose the family if you don't bring God into it. When are you going to bring God into it? Bump somebody and say, he's talking to you. you. Saves you. You don't have to say he's talking to me. (laughs) He's talking to you. He turns to the Lord and he prays. We're losing this. We're losing this because we'll post on social media how we feel before we tell God. He prays, he prays, he prays, he prays, he prays to the Lord and says, Lord, I beseech you. Lord, I'm begging you. Lord, I need you to pay attention to me right now. I beseech you. Remember, remember, remember now how I walk before you and truth in a perfect heart, and I've done that which is good in thy sight. He says, Lord, remember my track record. The reason I can stand flat-footed in my worst seasons up here and preach, the, the reason I don't break down when life is coming at me, is because whenever something is coming at me, My strength comes when I bring my past track record to God. You you remember from the time I was 19 to now, I gave my life to you. I drove church buses. I loved church people. I served in parking lots. I helped with the pastor security. I did this. I did that. And how are you going to let something like this happen to somebody like me? I'm not having it, God. I'm not having it, God. If life came at you right now and God, as the judge said, bring me some evidence that proves that I should change the verdict. What could you bring to God? Because what you bring to God is not your present worship. What you bring to God is your track record of worship. You gain confidence when you can bring a track record of worship. He's bringing a track record of worship. And he takes it a little further. 
I, Isaiah actually talks about, gives us a little bit of behind the scenes of, of the conversation and what he was feeling for God. But he, he says, God, the grave can't praise you. I love that. He says, Lord, if you kill me, you're losing a praiser. If you let this thing take me out, I don't ever want to hear you in heaven say, I don't have no worshipers down there. I don't have no tithers down there. I don't have no servers down there. He says, Lord, if, if you let me die like this, you are losing your, one of your best praisers. God says, I, I love when I find my best praisers coming to me. Because what praise does, God said in the word, he said, oh, no man, nothing. He says, debt is sin. We're all sinners. Debt is sin. But look at what he says. He, he says, if you praise me, what you do is you obligate me to move for you. So if God tells us to owe no man nothing, what our praise does is it puts God in a place to owe us something. So when I praise God in advance, what I'm doing is I'm saying in faith, Lord, I believe that you can do this. I believe that you're able. I am showing you through my praise that when you get me, you get somebody that makes the atmosphere change. He says, and if you lose me, the world is a worse place to be. If you died today, would the world be worse? Or would it be the same? The grave can't praise you. Oh, God, you see me every day. I get out of bed. I celebrate you. But understand this. Death can't celebrate you. You're going to lose somebody that's excited to get out of bed every day for you. They that go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. You're going to lose somebody that has faith to believe that you're able to do the impossible, God. The living. You give me life. The living. The living. He, he, he shall praise you. As I do this day, the father to the children shall make known thy truth. He says, Lord, if you get me out of this as a father, I promise you. My children will know your truth. But it says after he prays this, he breaks down crying. It shows me that sometimes I can love God and hurt at the same time. I can be a great person but struggling too. He breaks down and cries. He doesn't care who's in the room. He's just broken because he really expected God to pull this thing off. And Isaiah is left. And Isaiah gets to the middle of the courtyard. The middle, the middle the middle. Like the disciples in the ship, they were in the middle of the Galilee Sea when Jesus passed by and they started screaming and Jesus got on the boat, but he would have walked past them. Isaiah was in the middle. He was stuck in the middle and God spoke to him. The, the same word of the Lord that came to him the, the first time that spoke death, the word of the Lord came to him. And said, turn again. Turn again. Say, turn again. Amen. Tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, thy father. I've heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. It shows me that until you're crying about it, you're not ready for God to show up. There's something about tears that when God does it, you never turn back. There's something about tears. Those that sow in tears 
will reap and harvest, the psalmist said. There's something about tears that means that God finally has you where he wants you, David. You, you, you can finally give God that, that broken and contrite spirit he's been looking for. Tears are an indicator that the heart is warm. That the heart cares. Tears are an indicator that brokenness has taken place. And God says, it wasn't that I didn't hear your prayers. It's just that I was hearing prayers with no tears. And you show me a person that does not have tears. I'll show you a person that has not changed. Sometimes when I do counseling and, and something horrific takes place in a marriage, I'm not looking for what was done. Because most of the time I found it's not one or the other, it's a little bit of both that made something big happen. Not always the case, but most of the time. And what one or the other is looking for, the one that feels like the victim, what they're looking for is for me to give a yay or a nay on if it'll work. Do you think there's hope in this? And it's hard for me to give a yay when whoever was the victimizer or the abuser or the one that did something wrong, it's hard for me to give a yay when they're sitting there with a smile on their face. Because if I don't see tears I cannot even help or try to guarantee that there's been a change. And if there has not been a change, this will happen again. God says, I saw your tears, Hezekiah. I will. I will. Because I'm God. I I will. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I will. The medicine can't do it. The chemo can't do it. I will. I got this. I will heal thee. Look, look, look at what happens. I, Hezekiah is having this private conversation. Jesus said, what you pray in secret, I will do openly. He's, he's not doing this big old prayer to the room. He's not doing this big old prayer in front of Isaiah. He's praying all by himself. He's crying. He's depressed. He's frustrated. He, he has shortage in his life. He's in solitude. He's suffering and he's sick and he's talking to God all by himself. You mean to tell me I can talk to God all by myself and God will hear me? You mean to tell me that I don't always need somebody around me to get God's attention? You mean to tell me I can talk to God in my car? I can talk to God in my bedroom? I can talk to God in my bathroom? I can talk to God on my job? I can talk to God at hospice? You mean to tell me I can talk to God wherever I am and whatever I'm going through and God will hear? Yes, because truth be told, when you start talking to him alone, he knows now it's relational and it's not a show. And Hezekiah... I was just waiting to see, will you talk to me with tears running down your eyes when you're not in church? I will heal you. It's a good thing he didn't offend Isaiah. It's a good thing he didn't say the wrong news when Isaiah gave him a sermon he didn't like. He was hurt, but he stayed quiet because guess what? If he would have hurt Isaiah, he would have hurt God's mouthpiece to tell him he's healed. And he would have missed out on a key strategy for the healing. Because God didn't tell Hezekiah nothing. He told Isaiah, tell him, I will heal you. But here's the requirement. On the third day, you will go to the house of the Lord. He says, Hezekiah, 
you're going to find your healing in the house. So that means in your sickness, with your feet swelling, Hezekiah, you have to trust that when I get to church, I can say confidently, I wasn't having it. He says on the third day, resurrection, death, burial, resurrection, third day. Jesus rose on the third day. On the third day, I want you, on the third day, but this isn't Jesus. Jesus hasn't lived yet. Jesus has died. It's a principle. On the third day, when you go to the house, there should always be an expectation that whatever is dying in your life is about to have a resurrection. Do you still come to church with expectation for resurrection? So you can stay in the bed, Hezekiah. But you're going to miss out on your blessing if you do not get your butt to the house. Isn't it crazy that often God asks for the simplest things, but we tend to die because we're stubborn. <laughs> Isaiah has to be saying, what happened? He's in the middle of the courtyard and God turns him around. In the middle, not at the beginning, not at the end, right at the middle, in the middle of the problem, in the middle of the struggle, in the middle of the pain, in the middle of the depression, in the middle of the money running out. In, right in the middle, God turns it. And this Sunday, what God sent me to tell somebody is that if I can ever get you to live a life of worship, I will turn your situation around right in the middle of the worst time, right in the middle of your trauma, right in the middle of your grief, right in the middle of your sickness, right in the middle of the arguing. All I was waiting for, Hezekiah, was for you to turn away from people and turn to me, and I would show you that I would turn your situation around. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but if I'm talking to you, if there was a praise that could make Hezekiah's sickness turn around, I dare you to give God a praise that could make your situation turn around, that could make your marriage get better, that could make your relationship get stronger, that could make money come into your life, healing come into your life, your children getting right with Jesus. If there's a praise that could turn it around, I don't know what it looks like, I don't know what it feels like like for you but if God's telling you to shout shout if he's telling you to raise your hands raise your hands if he's telling you to run run if he's telling you to cry cry but God is looking for somebody that came to church today that says Lord I want you to turn this thing around say turn it Jesus turn the sickness turn the loneliness Turn the shortage, turn the suffering, turn the solitude, turn the sickness. Say, turn it, Jesus. All God was looking for was somebody that had a turn it kind of worship. And right in the middle of Isaiah's journey, out of the court, God said, turn around. Turn around. Because I'm God, I do what I want to do. I'm God. I can heal stage four because I'm, I'm God. I can heal HIV because I'm, I, I can heal AIDS because I'm, I, I, I can take pain out of somebody's back, pain out of somebody's leg because I'm God. I can give somebody their mind back because I'm God. I can make somebody's soul burn again because I'm God. I can get a hold of your children because I'm God. I can get a hold of your man or your woman because I am God. All I ever wanted was for you to love 
to worship me. Paul said, behold, I present my body as a living sacrifice. I am both the priest and the animal. I give you my body. Why? Because I give you my life and I am now crucified with Christ. But nevertheless, I live. You got me, God. All of my worship, all of my worship, you've got me, God. As jacked up as I am, you got me. Struggling, you got me. Going to fall sometimes, but you got me. I'm working on being a better man, but you got me. I'm working on being a better woman, but you, you got me. Have you made up in your mind that for the rest of your life, good times or bad, God's got you. He says, tell Hezekiah, I'm giving him 15 years. 15 more years. Grace times three. Because I'm a multiplier. The devil divides. A house divided can't stand. The devil divides. God says, I am in the business of multiplying. I multiply fish and loaves. I'm a multiplier. Tell him his new normal is grace times three. Oh, <laughs> let him know too because I won't be outdone. I am the God that does exceeding and abundantly above all that you may ask or think according to the power that worketh in you. I am able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that you may ask or think. Tell Hezekiah that I'm giving him what he asked for. But I'm also going to fight the enemy he doesn't know is coming. I'm also going to give him victory over the enemies that, 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 that are coming. Assyria is coming because the Assyrians would pry on people when they were weak. And you got to understand, when the enemy sees you down, he starts moving. Tell him that while he's been sick, the enemy has been plotting. While he's been sick, the enemy has been wondering how he can beat him and how he can take him out. But let him know that I see all things and I saw the enemy plotting. And because he worshipped me so well, I'm not just giving him his life back. I'm taking every battle that comes at him. The battles he knows about and the battles he doesn't know about. Because when God finds a worshiper, he always gives them victory in every area through Jesus Christ. And Hezekiah got better. And this would send waves through Israel that God is a healer. See, the reason that God wants to get you better is because he knows that when he heals you, it's going to send waves to everybody connected to you. And Hezekiah does one big thing for the Lord that if you're not, if you, if you're not, if you're not careful, you will miss it. It says in verse 20 that, that he did something. It used to seem so simple. I would just read over it. But it says in verse 20 that he built some waterways. And when I went to Israel, I got a chance to actually walk through the waterways that Hezekiah built. But he also built a pool, it says. He built a pool. And what was the pool eventually used for? It's the pool of Siloam. It's the pool where the man born blind was sitting. It was a pool that Jesus would perform at one day. And what did the sick man do? He made a way for sick people to get help. 
And what did this sick 19-year-old do? He gave his life to creating a pool, a place where Jesus could perform. And sick people could get the touch that I got at 19. God is trying to heal somebody for something so much bigger than you. And what I forgot to tell you, because it, this is what sick people tend to think about once God steps in, whether it's your mind, your body, or your soul. Once you get it, you know how the devil begins to play with your mind? And he begins to make you think now, for the moment you start praising God for the healing. You start praising God for whatever he did. You're, you're praising him. If it happened to 50, you are praising him. Because he did it. And David didn't lie when he said, I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed beg for bread. God didn't lie. He did it even though I'm 50, even though I'm 60, even though I'm 70. He did it. He didn't lie. And I'm glad he did it. But you know what creeps in about a month later? I wish he would have did it earlier. I wish he would have did it when I was 20. I wish I would have met you when I was 30. I, I wish I, I never would have made that first mistake. I, 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 I wish this would have happened quicker. I wish I would have found this job right out of college. Man, all the years I lost being in that bed sick. I wish I could get them back. All the, the practices I missed because I was sick. All the practices I missed because I was sick and getting high. I was sick and getting drunk. I was sick and running around and seeing dating is more important than being around my kids. All the years I lost, all the years I lost in the marriage, not telling you I love you, not bringing you flowers, not prioritizing date nights. All the years I lost, I'm grateful that God got me. But I wish I didn't have so much regret. Am I the only one that sometimes, just sometimes battles with regret? And Hezekiah, God says to Isaiah, tell Hezekiah, I'm, I'm going to turn the dial that the sun hits back some. He, he says, tell him he'll see the shadow on the dial reverse. And what is God trying to show us this morning? I think it was the proverb that said, he will restore the years that the locust and the canker worm have eaten. Hey, Hezekiah, I'm so good to you that I promise you, everything you lost, all the years you lost, I'm going to give them back to you. All because I saw your tears and heard your prayers and you have lived a life of showing me what I'm worth to you. Paul would say, I reckon the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Reckon is an accounting term. Paul says, I look at the books, and when I look back at my life, everything I went through to get to where I am now, God, I, I've, I've done the checks and the balances, and I've come to this conclusion. It was worth it. Whatever God had to use to push you to worship, it was good that I was afflicted. One day, you will say, it is worth it.